to the Bulwark Podcast. Usually I am joined by Will Salatan on Monday, but today it's Will and Charlie Tuesday. So first of all, happy Tuesday, Will. Thank you, Charlie. I don't know if I can handle the, the weirdness of Tuesday instead of Monday. I'm just making notes, by the way. Are you looking to take a vacation anywhere? I'm just, <laughs> I, no, I, I, uh, I have some thoughts for you. So I'm 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 making notes for uh, the the show today and thinking about the reports from uh, yesterday about this big uh, you know fire that broke out at the uh, at the oil storage facilities in Bryansk, this city in Russia, mm-hmm. and and of course in the fog of war, you know, is it the Ukrainians? Is it sabotage? Uh, as of the time that we're taping this, I I don't know the answer to this, but I'm looking up uh, Bryansk, which is a city in Russia, which by the way was founded either uh, the year 985 or 1146 which seems to be kind of a big range, right? I mean, it's like, uh, that's that's a, that's kind of a range. Yeah, th- those feel like times, not dates. Yeah, no, that's those are years, actually. But here's here was my thought, because as I looked up Bryansk, I have all the stories, you know, the pictures of the fire and the explosion and the fireball and the speculation and everything. But then they have this little thing over here, you know, um, profile of the city of Bryansk. Plan a trip, things to do, and places to stay. Three-star hotel, averaging... <laughs> Twenty dollars. <laughs> you can get you. Will Salatan can get a room for twenty dollars in Bryansk, Russia. So uh, if you're thinking of some place to go, and my guess is that price is probably not going up right now. <laughs> I was going to say I'm going to wait for a couple more quote fires, and then then you know the price will be down to where I can r- r- really clean up. Okay, so we we have to talk about Kevin McCarthy. We have to talk about Ron DeSantis. We have to talk about the French election. We have to talk about Elon Musk taking over the world. But can we just take a deep breath and start with the former president of the United States wanting to make it very, very clear to the world that he is not stupid and does not like to be called stupid. This is actually, this is not a parody. This is from Donald Trump's rally in Ohio over the weekend. They used to call me J.D. Uh, they may, they said maybe stupid. So I said to Doc Ronnie, you know, Doc Ronnie is now a great congressman in Texas. Great, very popular guy. I think he won by like 52 points or something. That's but he's now a great big. congressman. I said, Ronnie, uh, I don't like when people call me stupid. Uh-huh. I had great heritage, an uncle who was a great, great genius, a father who was a genius, everybody. Mm-hmm. They're all, we have a lot of geniuses. I don't like being called stupid. Is there a test or something I can take to prove to these radical left maniacs that I'm much smarter than them? Is there a test? And he said, sir, there is a test. It's called sir. the X test. Yeah, I sure. said, what's it like? He said, well, it uh, gets very tough. The first questions are easy, and the middle of the test gets tough, and the end of the test is quite tough. Well, I, I just going <laughs> to... See, I, I don't like to be called stupid either. <laughs> I'm not going to devote a podcast to it. <laughs> uh, you know, it, it's it's perfect, right? It's perfect. Yes. That, that, <laughs> that, that, I mean, nothing says stupid, like giving a speech yeah. and taking a big break in the middle of it to talk about how you hate people calling you stupid and then yeah. demonstrating yeah. your stupidity. It's perfect. Okay, that X test, that wasn't the camera woman thing, was it, right? This was a different test? That, no, know. that that must have been the W test or the Y test. This is, I, this is, I have never heard of this thing. Nobody's probably ever heard of this, the X test. Somebody must have written an X and he thought that meant something. I, I, yeah, but he I, wants to assure us that he's not stupid. He doesn't like to be called stupid. Uh, so first of all, it's hilarious, right? And secondly, on a serious note, thank God for the buffoonery of Donald Trump. I mean, we are blessed that the, the would-be autocrat who emerged in our country was a flaming idiot, as demonstrated by this clip and many other things, or he could have done a lot more damage. I mean, he he was strategically foolish politically, and he alienated people with his unnecessarily boorish behavior, and all of that made him, first of all, a one-term president instead of worse. And secondly, it, it crippled his ability while he was president to build a bigger coalition and do a lot more damage. So I am grateful for the stupidity. No, and you, you make an interesting point because I think people do need to think through what would it look like to have as president, with all those instincts, a more competent, less buffoonish Trump? What, what if you had somebody who you know, had the same you know inclinations but didn't have the... Uh, the comic relief slash just 
you know, stupidity of, of Donald Trump. That actually is scarier. I, I know that people are going, it can't get any worse than Trump. Don't even imply that anything is an improvement on or is, is even worse than Trump. But you can't get worse than Trump. Actually, you can. You can. Oh, my God. Yeah. You can get so yeah. much worse <laughs> than Trump. And, and, and honestly, Charlie, the, looking at what's been going on in Ukraine has really given me a much healthier perspective on Trump. I mean, what Trump did as president was nowhere near what Putin is doing. And part of it is that Putin is actually more ruthless than Trump. But part of it is that Putin was just, I mean, look, we, we now say Putin's an idiot because of his miscalculations in Ukraine. But Putin was able to do a lot more damage in his country and in the world just because he was that much smarter than Trump. So so yeah, that has completely changed my perspective on the Trump presidency. It can get much worse, and it did get much worse. Well, I was also thinking about this with you know you know watching the world hold its breath about the French election, and you know the the discussion of what it would mean for Europe and NATO and Ukraine and the United States if if you know if. if a far right figure like Marine Le Pen um, would would be elected, and you know, fortunately, she lost. She lost by a, a landslide. But um, th those of us in this country, we ought to just remember that. Okay, the French rejected her. We elected this guy, and right. uh, the consequences to the world of putting Donald Trump in the White House are like the French election times a thousand. Right. You know, in, in just in terms of the fragility of the world order and the consequences of it. Right. But can I raise a question here? Did the sequence play a role in the difference between these two outcomes? So the, the Brits went before us, right? Brexit was before us. Right. That happened. That did not affect Americans because Americans didn't look, probably just didn't care about Brexit that much. It wasn't a character. It wasn't a person get being, you know, becoming prime minister of the UK. Um, here, Trump goes first, and then the world gets to see what it's like to have a Trump. So I think that probably, well, you know, even as I say that, there were then a series of authoritarians elected in other countries. But I think the sequence matters in terms of- You think so too? Because yeah. It, it, it made it, you know, one of the things you, you, uh, you saw in France was that it was not unthinkable that she could be elected, that because Trump had been elected in 2016, it was possible. And that's why, even though the polls were, you know, making it pretty clear that Macron was going to be reelected, maybe not as big as he was, um, there, there wasn't that sense of complacency that they might have had, um, you know, had, had Trump not happened first. This, yeah. yeah. All right. Now, I want to ask you a question. Did you believe before Trump got elected that that could happen in this country? No, no, absolutely not. Did you? No, I, I really didn't. I thought that once Trump got nominated, it was over and the Democrats would win. So I had this weird presumption of rationality and Trump's election erased that for me. And so now, now I'm, a, so Anything's because possible. I then look at every other election after Trump and think it could happen again, I wonder if the French thought that too. My sense is that, uh, that they, they did. I mean, when you think about that election, you know, I know there's a lot of punditry about, well, you know, the fact is that Yes, he won, but the you know the far right got a you know a huge portion of the votes, which is all true. But look, this was a landslide victory by any standard. If a, if a candidate in the United States gets fifty nine percent of the vote, we call that a landslide. Ronald Reagan, I don't think, got fifty nine percent of the vote, did he? In uh, in nineteen eighty four. Uh, yeah, it was. I think it was fifty nine forty one that year. It was something like that. I mean, those are that's a massive blowout election. It's it's more extraordinary when you think about the fact that, that Macron is quite unpopular. I think his approval ratings were less than Joe Biden, and the left sat out the the race. You had a lot of people who just figured, you know, I I really don't want to, you know, a fascist president, but uh, I don't want to be pro Macron. Interesting that people made that choice, and yet he still got fifty nine percent of the vote. So that vote seems to me to be overwhelmingly anti Le Pen rather than pro uh, Macron. Yeah. And I wonder if it's kind of a model for what those of us who worry a lot about democracy in the United States would like to happen or would hope would happen in the case of somebody like Joe Biden. I mean, Joe Biden is not Emmanuel Macron. He has, right. In my opinion, he has more defects in terms of if you compare the two guys. Uh, but you, you, you would hope that people would say, People, a lot of people in the United States. Okay, so a lot of things suck right now. Inflation is too high. The border situation is bad. You know, the crime or whatever. But we can't have the alternative. We can't elect this other party or this other person right. in the case of Le And I just have no confidence that that is going to happen in this country. That the calculation that some people made in France will happen here. 
I don't know. I think you might see it, particularly after 2022. I think that the 2022 is going to be a massive reality check for some folks. We'll see. Some, I think that we've seen over and over again, though, that how many people are utterly immune to reality, reality checks of any of any kind. All right, let's talk a little bit about Kevin McCarthy. That feels like uh, it was a long time ago that we had uh, the, the audio tape of Kevin McCarthy having a brief spasm of, of conscience which he got over. He apparently went back and, and sufficiently groveled to Donald Trump over the weekend. Trump says that he and McCarthy are completely fine. I thought one of the interesting spins on all of this, though, was Karl Rove, who, and I got to confess to you, Will, there was a time when I thought that Karl Rove was, was, whether you liked him or not, he was very savvy political strategist and everything. But li listen, listen to this sort of, raw, undiluted whataboutism on one of the Sunday shows when he's asked about Kevin McCarthy, the Kevin McCarthy tape. And, and it's interesting to me that the press has jumped on this big time. But I mean, the president yeah. of the United States has made some recent statements. This week, I think it was, he repeated for the fourth time the story about the conductor uh, oh. who told him on Amtrak that he'd float, gone more on Amtrak than on Air Force One, who died a year before it was supposedly, you know, Rested in a civil rights protest, said I was against the Afghan war from the start when he wasn't. I mean, we don't have the same sort of symmetry here when it comes to misstatements or uh, claims that people make in public or private. I don't know. Maybe because the Biden stuff is like Joe Biden running at the mouth and who gives a shit? Whereas, <laughs> whereas Kevin McCarthy is likely to be the next speaker and is caught on tape saying that he was going to tell the president of the United States to resign, uh, that he was done with him. Um, yeah, uh, Carl, I, I think that was kind of newsworthy, but uh, you have a different take on this than I do, right, Will? Okay, so there's a couple things I want to say about this. First of all, it just kills me that Carl Rove actually uses the word symmetry there, right? I mean, symmetry, it, it, of course there's no symmetry, as you're pointing out between the two things. It's weird. This is Carl Rove doing what Carl Rove has always done, right? Hey, the media is picking on us when they don't look at the other side, right? Which is true in a lot of cases if you're a conservative. But like to, to overlook the difference between the context of a stupid story about a, an Amtrak conductor and like the, the, uh, an attack on the capital of the United States. <laughs> just, it, it's, yeah. it just shows how like Republicans have Not these- Not quite equivalent, yeah. No, no, but Republicans have these things. Oh, so look, I come from a Democratic background. This was way pre-Trump, Republicans doing this thing, doing, you know, they, 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 have their, they have their talking point and they hit their talking points. And one of their talking points is complaining about the media. It's just that what happened is the Republicans took that longstanding practice of theirs and took it across this line of defending democracy. And that is what shocked me. I didn't think I, I've seen Carl Rove do this before. I didn't think he would do it about this. But here we are. So are you surprised that uh, the, the McCarthy is, has the favor of heaven or at least the favor of Mar-a-Lago? Yeah, we, well, he's he's in the glorious position of of having Donald Trump's uh, forgiveness, explicit forgiveness for now. Right. For so now. Trump, Trump will hold now. that as leverage. I mean, imagine Kevin McCarthy with uh, a 230 seat majority in the House. Right. He's then at the mercy of any time Donald Trump wants to undercut him. Uh, so that gives Trump and Marjorie Taylor Greene and Matt Gates and those all those folks power over McCarthy. So I don't think McCarthy's out of the woods on this oh. at all. But but let me say one thing about the McCarthy thing. At first, I believed Kevin McCarthy actually meant to take that Donald Trump down when I first heard that audio. Mm -hmm. And then I saw Chris Christie doing his interpretation of what McCarthy said, and I was persuaded that I was wrong. Chris Christie's interpretation is Kevin McCarthy never said he was going to ask Trump to resign. He said that if the Senate, McCarthy said that if the Senate was about to convict Trump, and kick him out of office. We'd be in a Nixon situation, right? And therefore, he would suggest that Trump should resign, not because Trump did anything wrong, but because it's better than, than being formally kicked out of office by Congress. So that is a totally practical calculation, not a moral one. And I think Christie's right, because that's totally consistent with Kevin McCarthy's character, or in this case, lack thereof. Okay. I, I certainly don't want to come off as if I'm defending Kevin McCarthy in any way whatsoever, but I, I think Christie's wrong there, because there's that other soundbite where he says, I'm done with this guy. Um, no one should defend him. I'm not going to defend him. And so that 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 did appear to be a, a qualitative rejection of Trump's character. And what's interesting is that, uh, you know, Kevin McCarthy is, is now sort of spinning all of this, saying, no, I never asked the president to resign. Well, the tape, 
and the book doesn't say that he asked Trump to resign. What it says is that he told his colleagues he would do it. So once again, we find out that, you know, what a bullshitter uh, Kevin McCarthy is, is that is that on the phone, he's saying, yes, if I talk to the president, I will tell him X, Y and Z. But of course, he he doesn't actually uh you know, follow through on all that. See, I think what's fascinating is that is that he's not just simply groveling, but he's groveling in the particularly distinctively Trumpian way of denying that he had a flash of decency, that he had this moment uh, where he understood what his duty was. And what he's saying is now, no, 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 not really. I I really never did have that flash of decency and conscience and duty. Um, and if I did, I got over it really, really quickly. And I'm sorry for that. Yeah, uh, that's so and, true. And this is what Donald Trump loves. He he loves, you know, being this instrument of humiliation. How far? I mean, I do think there's part of him. His kink is how far can I push people? What can I get them to say? What can I get you to apologize for? So, I mean, Donald Trump has got to be happy, because, as you point out. He has, you know, potentially the next speaker of the House of Representatives on his knees apologizing to him and acknowledging that he has no political future except by repeating Donald Trump's lies. I mean, he owns Kevin McCarthy. Yeah. And there's nothing McCarthy can do about it at this point. Right. He's totally dependent. And actually, your point about the, the nature of McCarthy's gaffe really really strikes home. It's, it reminds me very much of my mentor in journalism, Michael Kinsley, who yes. used to say that a gaffe, Kinsley used to say, a gaffe is when a politician tells the truth, mm -hmm. like was Social Security bankrupting the country or whatever. But in, in the Trump era, it's not tells the truth, it's, it does the right thing, right? It's sort of a gaffe is when, you know, Kevin McCarthy now has to clean up the fact that he spoke the moral truth that Donald, right. what Donald Trump did was reprehensible. I apologize for that. I just had this, this thing where I thought about my, my oath to the constitution and putting the country first over party. And wow, I don't know what happened to me, but I got over it. I tr trust me, this will never ever happen again. Mr. Trump, sir, yeah. sir. Yeah. Okay, so I want to get your take on Elon Musk, the new Twitter czar. I want to get your take on that, Will, but let's do that right after this. This episode is brought to you by The Jordan Harbinger Show, which features in-depth interviews with some of the world's most fascinating minds like Ray Dalio and Malcolm Gladwell. Every Friday, Jordan also releases a Feedback Friday episode to respond to listener questions covering everything from conventional problems like leaving a dream job to doozies like helping someone escape an abusive relationship. You could also hear the latest news about Russia featuring a heavy hitting interview with Gary Kasparov and his experience with authoritarian governments. And that's just the beginning. Search for The Jordan Harbinger Show. That's H-A-R-B as in boy, I-N as in Nancy, G-E-R in Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you're listening right now. Okay, Will Salatan. Twitter has decided that, uh, hey, forget about that poison pill. You're offering too much money for us to say no. So Yeah, so I didn't expect this. A lot uh, of hysterical <laughs> takes, though, out there. <laughs> uh, and Charlie, honestly, I don't know what to make of whether it's good or bad. I mean, I uh, all right, let me confess up front. I am probably the most pro-Twitter person at the Bulwark. Um, it, I'm you know, pretty pro-Twitter. Yeah, you're an excellent user of it, and you, I believe you understand how it can be used in a productive way, and that's kind of where I am about it. Like, I think Twitter is a marvelous tool for very quick exchange of, inf of information and intelligence. You get a bunch of idiots in Twitter, because that's humanity, but you can just, <laughs> you, your job is to ignore them. In a free society, they're idiots, you, you ignore them. So I'm not sure any of that is going to change, right? The one thing that I've heard that Elon Musk might do, and this is pure speculation, was people say he'll let Trump back on on the, the platform. Guaranteed, absolutely. Uh, he will. And so I wanna hear what you think about it. My initial take is good, actually. I think it's healthy for America to see the, this. I don't want Donald Trump to be out there lurking with a 40% support against Joe Biden with a very good chance of becoming the next president and us ignoring him. So I know it's bad for the mental health of a lot of America, but I think we need to see the threat. We need to see the Putins. We need to see the Le Pens and we need to see the Trumps. Well, I don't know whether it's a good thing or not, um, but I think there's a little bit of irony here is that I think it's it's a lock's certainty that that Elon Musk would let Trump back in, which, <laughs> and this is, this is the part where it's like, uh, you know, irony is just having a good day here. It would kill Donald Trump's truth social, which is already pretty much dead. But think about all of the money and all of the effort that uh, Donald Trump has put into having his own social media network. And that would just 
forget about all of that. So yeah, would, would Twitter become more of a cesspool? Yes, likely. You know, Elon Musk is, I have mixed feelings about him, um, mostly uh, concerned. I mean, as a, he's obviously brilliant. He's obviously a genius. He obviously gets things done. And he's obviously very, very dangerous. So I have a question for you. And I, I don't expect that we're going to resolve this right now. And it's a, this is like a preliminary thing that I'm thinking about. Mm -hmm. What is the definition of an oligarch? I know, you know what's where I'm going here? I mean, I, we, we talk about the oligarch, the Russian oligarchs. Is there any Russian oligarch that has the, the power and the influence in Russian society that our oligarchs have, and yet we don't really want to call them oligarchs? Okay, so I, I actually, because what else am I going to do? I look up oligarch, you know, on the internet, you know? So um, a very rich business leader with a great deal of political influence. Okay, um, let's go to Miriam Webster. Government by the few. Um, let's see, government by the few, the, the corporation is ruled by oligarchy, or a government in which a small group exercises control, especially for corrupt and selfish purposes. Hmm. We are living in a time when a handful of really, really, really rich people have tremendous power, political power, cultural power, economic power. Uh, and we used to have different terminology for that. So what are we? Are we living in our new age of oligarchy or or would you like to call it a new gilded age or what? I mean, what uh, do you think oh, about this? Okay, so I'm kind of a libertarian about this. First of all, to answer your first question, I'm, there are all the dictionary definitions. My definition of an oligarch is a rich guy I disagree with. Right. Okay, I fair mean, enough. If, you're, yeah. if the rich guy's on your side, George Soros, hey, no problem, right? The rich guy's on the other side, yeah. Peter Thiel, you know, whatever. So uh, it's a term that's largely abused. But I am particular, as I think about your question, what I think about is I want to know what role the state is playing in your calculation of power here, right? So if, if the oligarch is, if the rich guy is exercising his power through the state, yeah, then I am then I'm going to call that oligarchy. Okay. If the rich guy is exercising his power through financial control of a platform, then he has power in society. And then we do need to talk about the nature of that power, right? To control Twitter, to control large parts of the internet, for example. But it's not the same as having control of the state. And I just want to keep that distinction in mind because once the state Very gets involved, important. it gets a lot worse. See, this is a very important distinction here. And I, I by the way, I agree with that. Um, this this distinction is very very important, which is why I think uh, what Ron DeSantis is doing is so ominous. Uh, the the incredible willingness uh, of folks on the right to celebrate and embrace the use of state power to retaliate against corporations for political speech for engaging in wrong thing, I have to say is is really kind of extraordinary. I don't know if it's as extraordinary to you as it is to me. Um, you know, having come from the world where, you know, every conservative um, celebrated Citizens United that, you know, corporations were people and that we had to protect their their First Amendment rights, uh, uh, the most important cases in the world, you know, Hobby Lobby fighting against the government, uh, you know, the, the, the cake maker. Uh, and, and now it's suddenly this is great. This is wonderful. If you have woke corporations that take these, you know, that that actually defy what the politicians are doing, let's hammer them hammer them in ways that have nothing to do with the actual speech. I mean, I, there's, it's one thing to say regulate behavior you think is antisocial, but in Florida, they're making no pretense about that whatsoever. I mean, there's, there's, no, there's no relationship between the, the, you know, whatever you want to call that don't say gay bill and what they're doing to Disney. It's, it's just pure, raw revenge. Yeah, this is an area where your writing and the writing of uh, Jonathan Chait has influenced me a lot. I have been what what I've been noticing is what you guys have sort of identified is the nexus between the creeping authoritarian, the incremental authoritarianism of say an Orban and the the lesser but on the same sort of scale, same spectrum uh, of creeping authoritarianism of Ron DeSantis, right? And I don't, I'm not going to go crazy here and say that what's going on in Florida is the same as what's going on in Hungary. But this is this is how it, it you don't necessarily get authoritarianism in one fell swoop, right? You 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 can have sort of favors 
uh, uh, given, granted, and that or withheld by the by the government from the from corporations to exercise power, and that can gradually become sort of a form of state encroachment, so that uh, which can then gradually um, influence whether the government can even be removed by in the next election. So that's just a thing that concerns me that I think you've identified well. Well, see, this is part of, uh, I, I think, the poverty of our political vocabulary, that we don't know how to describe these things. I don't think that we fully understand what Orbanism is. You know, in, in, uh, in uh, you know, Viktor Orban's Hungary, which is an authoritarian regime, you know, you, you don't have uh, jackbooted thugs, you know, showing up in the middle of the night and arresting you and shooting you in the back of the head, right? But, but there's a different style. It is sort of this crony culture where um, if you are uh, loyal uh, and supportive of the regime, you get favors, you get perks, uh, you get franchises. Uh, if you are critical of it, you are starved of those resources, you are selectively uh, regulated. So there are subtle ways of tipping the balance well, that are not actually that subtle. I don't think the Hungarians would think of it as, as subtle, but you, you can see that this is now being internalized on the right. I mean, I think, you know, just watching Ben Shapiro, or watching National Review is absolutely fascinating. Ben Shapiro's whole shtick has been free speech, free speech on campus, right? Now he's doing these videos saying to corporations, fuck around and see what happens to you. You know, speak out, you know, take positions on these issues and see what we do with you is we're going to take this two by four. It's like it's not even pretending that you think that they, that the government should not you know, regulate your speech or punish you for this, for any kind of speech. Yeah. This is reminding me of, I mean, when Donald Trump ran for president, he completed a, a change that, that had been in the works, works for a while, which was the Republicans were the party of military nationalism. Yeah. Democrats were the party of economic nationalism, economic populism. Democrats had little regard for free enterprise, um, and, and they would they they often played to sort of cultural prejudices, like Dick Gephardt way back in the day. This is before a lot of people were born. Dick Gephardt he was a Democrat and ran for president, and he talked about you know we're going to stick it to the Koreans and the stick it to the Japanese, and they're like you know they're they're these foreigners who are screwing us, and we're just going to like st we're we're going to use the power of the state against these these corporations. So it was an economic message, but it was also also a cultural message. And what Donald Trump did was he came along and he said, why should we Republicans leave that to the Democrats? So Trump decided he was going to be both right. the, a military nationalist and play to all sorts of ethnic prejudices against Muslims and Latinos and all that stuff. But he was also going to do the economic nationalism and say, we're going to like get trade, you know, we're going to like stick it, we're going to have trade barriers, we're going to, you know, slap tariffs on everybody. And what, and so what I see happening in the Republican, what I think is happening in the Republican Party now is other Republicans, never mind Trump, Trump could die tomorrow and this would still be going on, have figured out, you know, why are we being the party of free enterprise when we could be exploiting popular prejudices what, exactly right. against the gays, right, or who, whoever it is, you know, the woke corporations. And so you're playing to to these cultural prejudices and you're just chucking aside this sort of politically costly principle of, of free enterprise. I think that's true. But again, to characterize this as like, you know, in favor of the working class, I think kind of misses the point because the working class isn't benefiting. So worst example of this sort of new sort of demagogic uh, populism, which I don't think is populism. I love these stories about Texas Governor Greg Abbott's in enhanced truck inspections. Did you follow this? You know, where he shut down the border for a while. They have these enhanced truck inspections to show that he was tough on the border. Turns out it turned up zero drugs, zero migrants, but cost Texas consumers and businesses an estimated $4.2 billion. <laughs> the delays of the trucks resulted in $240 million in spoiled produce alone. So, uh, you know, if, if Texas were more competitive this year, this would be one of the things that would cost you your job. I mean, you know, but again, a reminder, this performative assholery has real consequences in the real world. Yeah. I mean, but think of the context here. We have what, 8% inflation lately? Know. You know, we have we have major supply chain issues. You're gonna stop the trucks coming in? I mean, let, let's go back to the principle of free trade for a minute. What would actually help the economy is to facilitate the flow of goods, right? And honestly, Charlie, that facilitate the flow of people. I'm, I'm not saying like let everybody in who comes to the border. I'm not for like chaos, but right. like immigrate, we should be increasing immigration. We have we have like a full employment economy, right? There's never been a better time for like, hey, we need people to fill jobs. Let's let them into this country legally through a process. 
and let the, for God's sake, let the goods in, but to be, you know, a, a, trying to do a gesture to Fox news by, <laughs> by shutting down commerce. Crazy. Absolutely nuts. Okay. So why is Joe Biden not saying what you just said? <sighs> There's a lot of reasons why Joe Biden doesn't say things that need to be said. I mean, there, there's, I was really struck over the weekend looking, watching regular, what I think of mainstream media, you know, the, the networks, and then watching Fox News and just this complete disjunction between what, what's covered, right? You're not going to see any border stuff. I saw nothing about the border on the regular networks. I go over to Fox and it's border, border, border. And okay, Fox is overplaying it, but that's not healthy for like the mainstream media to be ignoring like the, the massive problems going on in terms of you know, people being yeah. arrested at the border. And it's, uh, forgive me if I circle back for a second yeah. to a previous topic. We were talking about Elon Musk buying Twitter and killing Truth Social. That would be awesome, Charlie. It would be awesome because we need to be having a national conversation again where pe the blue people and the red people are, are talking. We can yell at each other. It can be unpleasant, but at least we are talking about similar things. Have a shared reality. Okay, yes, so, a shared so reality. The question I asked was, why is Joe Biden not talking about bringing in more workers, having more legal immigration to deal with the worker shortage? Is it because uh, he exists in a uh, in a media bubble where nobody thinks that this is an issue. I see. I, I I look at it sort of the opposite way. I think that he is that the Democrats are too intimidated by a bad story on on Fox News that that they that they're worried about all of that. That rather than saying, okay, you know what, if people are worried about you know too many brown people coming, um, we've probably lost those votes anyway. Let's actually now go back and say, what does it take to get inflation down, to get uh, workers into this? We need to crack down on illegal immigrants. Let's bring in legal immigrants. Why is it so hard for the Biden administration to come up with a positive message there? Because they appear to be back on their heels on every single aspect of this. Don't you think it's just that they decided this is a bad issue for them and they're better off ignoring it and they think they yes. can get away with that because the media is on their side? Yes. Yes. I, I, I do think I do think that's uh, that's part of the problem, which isn't working out well for them. So. All right. You get to pick the next topic. What do you want to talk about now? I, well, I just want to yeah. say one more thing sure. about that, which is this is like a classic case of what's wrong with. The, our political, I'm, I swore I would never use the word discourse. I'll use it here. What's wrong with our political discourse, our political conversations? We, the, the one party, each party owns, quote, owns certain issues and decides that other issues are the other party's issues yes. and won't talk about them. Right. And so the worst possible thing is like our, our bifurcated internet where you, you, one party has Truth Social, the other party has Twitter or whatever. And then you just don't get, you just don't hear about half of what's out there. And so, yeah. So anyway, that's really disturbing. No, um, I, 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 th I think that's true. And, and by the way, I mean, this does explain it. It's, you know, I, I think it explains the, the difficulty that some folks have to, you know, encounter these real issues. Did you, did you see Tim Miller's piece on Monday in, in the bulletin oh, about, yeah. about what's about to happen in San Francisco? Now this is going to annoy many of our listeners, but in San Francisco, there is about to be a huge revolt of democratic voters against woke Democrats. In case Democrats, you know, are in any doubt about whether they have a progressive problem, watch what happens. He writes in in three elections over the next three months, voters in America's premier progressive bastion are poised to have rejected members of the city's left wing school board, elected a mainstream uh, Democrat over progressive icon to the state assembly and recalled the radical district attorney. And if polls hold up in the district attorney's race, all of these results will have come with landslide margins. This is an amazing story. The two woke for San Francisco, a story. Yeah, no, I think Tim's piece is really good because it, it captures a general rule, which is ideologues, they're not good at governing, Charlie. They're not good at right, right-wing ideologues, left-wing ideologues. I'm not saying they're all the same, right? But as a general rule, people who come in wanting to sort of make a statement to transform the culture, sometimes the culture needs to be transformed, but you got to do the job. And the job is like educate the kids, control the crime, right? Grow the local economy, get build jobs, whatever. And and so if people who come in and don't do those things, first of all, you're undercutting your own movement, right? If you say, look, we need to 
we need to rename the schools because the, their society has been racist, right? You're not going to help the anti-racism movement by defining it in, to, in the public mind as, as we focused on that instead of doing the job. Then that just gets more people pissed off about wokeness. What you do is you do the job, and while you're doing the job, you gradually sort of change the culture. But you, you can't do it to the exclusion of the job. Well, it's not just doing the job. I mean, the, the, these are people who have a very, very different idea of what the job is. And they have really, in, in terms of crime, in terms of education. What I think is interesting is the way that uh, Tim cast this as this is the revolt of the Obama Democrats. And he actually quotes Ben LeBolt, who was national spokesman for uh, for Obama during the actual Yes, We Can campaign. He, mm -hmm. he uh, Ben LeBolt lives in San Francisco, and he puts it this way about what's happening there. The tide is now turning out with the ideologues and in with Democrats that are not willing to defend children stepping on needles, drop prosecutions for hate crimes against the Asian American community, or a school board that tried to cancel Abraham Lincoln. Obama Democrats have always believed that good policy and good government can change people's lives for the better. In San Francisco, we pragmatists demand change and we are getting it, um, as opposed to you know, the people who have, have embraced identitarian critical theory, um, who are, are, and again, there are people who believe, you know, defunding the police, um, the very, very sort of radical uh, postures there. So a, a, I'm looking at this and thinking you have this revolt of the non-crazy Democrats against the crazy Democrats, simplifying it. Why don't we not see the same sort of thing among Republicans? Or do you think at some point we will? What is it about Democrats that they're willing to say, I'm sorry, you're a fellow Democrat, but you're nuts. I'm not going this way. And we're going to throw you out of office when on the right right now, it's like, OK, you've done something crazy. All right. Maybe if I just close my eyes and look the other way, it'll, you know, it, it won't affect me. But there, there is there's no indication that there's a Republican revolt against, you know, Greg Abbott or Ron DeSantis. So what's the difference? What's the difference between these That's two parties? That's such a great question, Charlie. And and it just reminds me of, you know, I I was on a, Tim and I did a podcast a couple of weeks ago and I accused him of being a wishful liberal. He sounded like a wishful liberal talking about like how America could change. And this piece of Tim's is sort of in this vein, but I think that the, con I think you're right about the difference in the context. That is to say, when I came to the bulwark, one of the funny things about bulwark people to me as an outsider was <laughs> sort of, you guys like, you, you had this experience of trying to sort of talk sense into the Republican Party yeah. and losing, failed. just losing, yes. <laughs> right? Absolutely fail. Like, why totally. don't you people, why can't you be sane? How do the, how do the crazy people take over? Let's take back over the party from the crazy people. Fail, fail, fail. Yep. And then so sure. people are homeless, move over to the Democratic Party. It, look, you can't have the Republicans <laughs> running things. And so then the Democratic Party, then some crazy people start to take over and bulwark people are like, okay. You will, will all of you sane Democrats please restore some sanity to the party and please, you know, Joe Biden got nominated, got elected. That's a good first step. And I see the same pattern and, you know, <laughs> hoping that the, the sane people will control the crazy people. But I think you are right, Charlie. I think you are right that it is different. I think that it will work, that it does work in the Democratic Party differently. It works more than it did in the Republican Party. My answer to your question, and I'm just shooting. The, I don't know the answer, but it certainly appears to me that there is a fundamental asymmetry in cultishness between yeah, the two parties. I think so. Um, I mean, there are plenty of cultish Democrats. Uh, they're on the far left, but there's not enough of them. I mean, the Democratic Party, and, and Charlie, this is totally related to another complaint of bulwark people, which is like, bulwark people come from the Republican Party, and they look at the Democrats and they say, why don't you guys have any message discipline, right? You're all over the place. You can't drive a message. You can't get it together. Here's what you need to do. And the fundamental chaos of the Democratic Party simultaneously makes it less politically competent than the Republican Party and much, much safer and saner as a governing party. Yeah, sanity may be a, uh, a disadvantage these days. So as you were describing the, the fate of the bulwark, trying and failing to get the Republicans to be sane and then, you know, trying and maybe failing, who knows, to get Democrats to be sane. It's it kind of reminds me of that book by Jim Hightower. Remember Jim Hightower from uh, oh, Texas? Yeah. He said, there's nothing in the middle of the road but yellow stripes and dead armadillos. <laughs> so we are the, if we, if we ever create a band at the Bulwark, it'll be the dead armadillos. <laughs> <laughs> that is such a great idea. I, I'm already, in, I'm envisioning the album cover. Yeah, the dead armadillos. All right, so you get to pick the topic now. Uh, COVID, COVID. Okay. 
So uh, well, I got well, wait, trouble. We're, we're over. We're over to that. It's done. Right? <laughs> I got so part of my. I I am more in the it's over camp than my friends are, right. and I mean it's not over, right? Yeah. There's always an, I think we're in a lull, and there'll be a, there BA two is here. There'll be BA. There's already another BA. I forget what the number is, Charlie, but there's always another one coming. So I got in trouble the last couple of days for saying something uh, using a term. The term is performative masking. Okay. Mm -hmm. And I was trying to, it, this was occasioned by Scott Gottlieb and some other folks drawing a distinction between what I think of as real masks and performative. A real mask is like an, a KN95. It, it, it's, it's effective in reducing the spread of COVID. Right. It helps me stop, not infect you, helps you not infect me. Um, then there's what I call performative masks. And the performative mask is like a cloth mask. And, and I will confess, I have in my house, and maybe everyone else does too, I have some real masks and I have some performative masks. I, raising my and, hand, raising my hand. Yeah. yeah. So, so I apologize to all the folks on Twitter who were offended that I talked about performative masking. If you are one of the folks who are out there using a cloth mask, thinking it's more effective than it is, that is sincere. I apologize. I'm not accusing you of being performative. I am accusing myself, but I'm also accusing lots of other people like me. So my situation, you, Charlie, you can tell me what yours is. I am living in suburban Washington, D.C., and I go into the grocery store and I have my, I don't have a, a real mask with me. I have a performative mask in my pocket. Mm -hmm. I am looking at the door. Does it, is it say a mask is required? If so, I wear one. I then go inside. Are people wearing masks? If everyone is wearing masks, I put on my performative mask. I'm not putting it on because I think I'm making a difference. I'm putting it on because I'm being polite. Right. It's like putting on I'm Jewish. So I go into a congregation. Solidarity. Everyone's wearing, yeah. Yeah, right. I, yeah. If I go into a congregation, everyone's wearing skull caps. I'm I'll put one on to blend in. So I'm that's what I'm doing with the mask. If I want to do a real mask, I'm going to bring the KN95. So that's my story. What's your practice, Charlie? Um, it's relatively similar to that, except that my wife buys all of our masks. And so they are all KN95. But I do leave them in my pocket, um, except under the circumstances you've described. Uh, so I, I'm, I'm going to be flying somewhere on, in fact, flying out to, in your direction on Thursday. And I don't know what the rules are going to be. Did, by the way, did the Biden administration ever actually file that appeal against the court order? Or did they just say they were going to file the appeal? They said they would, and I'm sure they will. I, well, but I mean, the clock's running on all of this. You know? I mean, the, the, it was supposed to expire uh, uh, like next Monday. Or next right, Tuesday, but they don't right? actually care. They don't care about that deadline because all they right. care about is having the long-term authority under CDC yeah, to yeah, do this. Yeah. So the my my question is: so when I show up at the airport, am I going to have to wear the mask or not? When I get on the airplane, am I going to have to wear the mask or not? And obviously, I'm going to look around. Please do not DM me about all of this. So, who was most offended at your use of the word performative masking? Oh, people who wear masks or who support mask use and don't want to be accused of of being unserious about it, or don't you know? Also. Honestly, a lot of sort of liberals who were right about mask wearing two years ago yeah. and were sort of right maybe a year ago and are not really right anymore, but are still stuck in that in that. Way See, this is what's hard about how, you know, changing circumstances that you could have been right. I mean, adamantly right two years ago and now eh, not so much for, but you have that sort of muscle memory of conviction. And it's like, I, I just, I remember, you know, being indignant about the people that were, you know, radically irresponsible and reckless and haven't changed my position on all of that. So, no, I, I, I understand it's a, it's a complicated situation and there's so many mixed messages here. It's, um, uh, so, you know, I, I, I took my eye off the ball for a second there and I'm in a couple of days and, uh, or maybe I took my eyes off. Did we hit the million death mark? I don't think we're there yet. Okay. We're heading there, but because, we're not there because, yet. Because we are going to acknowledge that, right? Yeah, but does it really matter? Does it? I mean, it's yeah. 900,000 was plenty. No, I mean, it matters. I mean, it, it's, it's just that considering that we are all over it. So it's like, how do you process the fact that, okay, we, we actually are at a, at a million. So no, I, I have mixed feelings about the mask. I wish it was over. We're not over. Uh, I am a little bit frustrated. Did I, did I tell you that that I got my uh, second booster last week? Congratulations! Well, I you know I'm, it was the right thing to do. Knocked me out again, though. Right? Can I just point out to all the people on social media who think that vaccines are dangerous? Charlie and I have both had a second booster, and we're both alive. So you know that that's that's two solid anecdotes in favor of the vaccines. Not to mention all the data in all the world. 
in support of the in support of the vaccines. Yeah, all the data uh, in all the world. But other than that, <laughs> there are still questions I, about it. I just want to say one other thing about the mask, which is sort of drives me crazy. The same liberals who, you know, are get so upset about, you know, ragging on cloth masks. Hey, it's better if people do something. Yes, it is better to wear a cloth mask than to wear nothing, right? But it, you, they would never do this. Liberals would never say this about birth control, right? There is good birth control. There is bad birth control. It matters which kind of birth control you use, right? And you, if you're going to be a, a good, practical liberal, you, you should care about the difference between these things. So when the public health people go out on TV, as they have been for the last couple of weeks, and say there is a fundamental difference between the cloth masks and the real masks. And, you know, that's, they're not saying, that's not an anti-mask message. That is a pro-effective mask message. And if you believe in, you know, saving lives and keeping the number under a million, you should support that. Yes. Okay. So one last thing, uh, over the weekend, we perhaps got an answer or a partial answer to the big mystery of the last week, which, which was what was in those math textbooks that they dropped in in Florida, because remember they 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 you know rejected all of these math textbooks for being woke or, or something, but they didn't provide any examples whatsoever, which was really puzzling when you think about it. I mean, if you have something bad, you know, put it on the whiteboard, right? You know, put it out there. Well, the New York Times over the weekend, I'm sure you saw this, uh, you know, looked at what was in those math books, and their best guess, as far as I can tell, was that. Uh, that the Florida folks objected to what's known as social emotional learning. It's SEL, social emotional learning, which is kind of this benign, it's positive, not controversial. Like, you know, how do you feel about all of this? I mean, I to, to me, it's a little bit touchy feely. It's a little bit silly, but it's not about race. It's not about leftist ideology. It's just sort of about hey, can you talk about your math anxiety or something? Okay, so I mean, look, I, I'm completely capable of, of mocking that, but would I reject a textbook because it has social emotional learning? No, but I thought what was really interesting is they got on the horn with the country's leading ideological ambulance chaser, Christopher Rufo. He's the guy who you know pushed the panic about critical race theory, now pushing the grooming panic. And he just can't let this go. And and he, he he does an interview with them and he talks about the social emotional learning stuff. And and this is his direct quote. I'm really glad they quoted him because I mean, this is just nutso. The intention of SEL, social emotional learning, is to soften children at an emotional level, reinterpret their normative behavior as an expression of repression, whiteness, or internalized racism and then rewire their behavior according to the dictates of left-wing ideology. <laughs> Whoa, that's, that's a lot. <laughs> you, this is the paranoid style of politics on steroids. This is, ah, but I had them on the strawberry stuff. So there, there's nothing about whiteness. There's nothing about internalized racism, but he reads it into these little cartoon pictures where it encourages kids to talk about how they feel about math. You see, once you start talking about feelings, before you know it, you are what? You are Noam Chomsky. I, I don't know what. <laughs> isn't isn't this a beautiful, a I mean, fake. awful, but yeah. yeah. I mean, mm -hmm. it's it's a beautiful illustration of how every movement eventually becomes the opposite of what it's set out to, to do or claim, right? So, so Rufo's whole shtick was, uh, you, you know, what's wrong with these people, the critical race theory, whatever, and let's set aside the whole debate about what that is. Yeah. It, it's, uh, they say everything is racist. Right. They say everything is sexist, right? They read this into everything. And so he starts this movement and the Republican Party latches onto it and they push it everywhere and they attribute everything to critical race theory and then to gender ideology and group. Yada. And eventually you end up with this movement becoming so ideological and so rabid that it is now doing exactly what it accused liberals. That's really of good. Did, right. Yeah, it is. Yeah, everything good. is anti-racism. Right. And you say, well, wait, I didn't say anything about race or sex. I was just talking about, you know, the kids feelings and like, oh, you say that. But what you really mean is. And 
that pisses people off, Charlie. That I mean, Rufo was he was politically correct. Politically, I can't say that term. Yeah, yeah. Politically accurate at the beginning. That a lot of people get pissed off when they are accused of implicit racism or accused of implicit sexism. But people are also going to get pissed off about being accused that that their kids studying something about learning about emotions is some sort of left-wing ideology. They're, yeah. they're not going to like that attribution. Well, it's, it's sort of like the problem of the witch hunter who runs out of witches. You know, it's like, yes. oh, okay, so there's not exactly a witch, but if you wear this kind of... I mean, he admits that this stuff is sort of positive and non-controversial, but now it, it's a delivery mechanism for radical pedagogies, and he's going to find it under every single bed. So I right. this is this is one of those things where... Usually it takes longer for someone to get to that point of becoming a caricature of themselves. But Rufo is is working at such hyper speed and he's gotten such success uh, and he keeps looking for the next thing. And it is interesting that there are normal, normally, you know, not completely crazy people on the right who feel the need to take him seriously. I mean, the Manhattan Institute, uh, you know, you have people from, you know, National Review and, and the Washington Examiner who will come up with the actually Christopher Rufo is being treated unfairly, even though he's been caught bullshitting and lying about all of this stuff. And so he's 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 playing this string out. But I, I wrote in my newsletter, the more he talks, the more I think he exposes himself for you know, the charlatan that he is and, and how thin it is. But but now we're at the any sort of social emotional um, learning is now a delivery mechanism for radical pedagogies such as critical race theory and gender deconstructionism, not actually critical race theory, not actually gender deconstructionism. But, you know, when you start talking to kids and get them in touch with their emotions, you know where that's going, right? George Soros, yeah. space laser shit. Yeah, and 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 this is sort of so you know the, the Manhattan Institute and others they attach themselves to Rufo, and Rufo starts out with one issue, race, right? Mm -hmm. Critical race theory, and that works politically because he's talking to white people, which is a lot of this country, right? And it, as long as he focuses on that one thing politically, he's doing okay. But it is in the nature of movements to expand, right, and to sort of take on a larger agenda. Right. So he moves on to the to the gays, right? He said uh, that everything's going to be about gender ideology, transgender, and so. Again, he thinks he's picked a smart political target, right? Not many people are gay, not many people are trans. But what happens over time is you don't just get to pick one target, then another, then another. Eventually, the story becomes you. The story becomes you are not just going to stop at race. You're not just going to stop at homosexuality. You're going to expand to a larger array of targets. And then people start to wonder whether they're going to become a target. I'm Jewish, right? How long before Rufoism? is going after like Holocaust education or something like that. I, I you know, maybe not, oh, but I, I, yeah. I start to get my, my, my little hackles start to go up. I start to worry about it. And I wonder if that starts to happen to other people too. Well, you ought to worry about it. In fact, I, I have some stuff I might write later this week about all the, hey, but I have a present for you since you've been uh, such a, a good sport today. If you actually go to Christopher Rufo's Twitter page, this is so good. His pinned tweet at the very top, P.S., he writes, I am fighting against critical race theory through investigative reporting, policy advocacy, and legal warfare. If you want to support this work, you can make a $5 or $10 monthly contribution here. And the, the, the title is Support My Work. So there he is like, hey, you know, Christopher Rufo, is he a grifter? Yes, it's right the freak there. So... <laughs> You know, we we started out this podcast accusing the Republican Party of abandoning entrepreneurship. And I just I think Christopher Rufo vindicates they're still interested in entrepreneurship if it's about raising money for themselves. OK, one last point. I said we were done. The most popular Democratic senator in America is who knows Joe Manchin. Oh, new uh, morning console poll. Eh, don't DM me. 57% of West Virginia voters approve of Manchin's job performance, up from 40% during the first quarter of 2021 over the past year. Manchin has doubled his approval rating among West Virginia Republicans. No senator has, is higher than that. So who are the most popular senators? John Thune, Republican of South Dakota, 62%. John Barrasso, Republican of Wyoming, 62%. Bernie Sanders, who's an independent, has 62%. Mike Rounds, Republican of South Dakota. Cindy Lumens, Republican of Wyoming, 60%. And uh, actually, no, I'm, I'm wrong about this. Pat Leahy, 
is listed as an independent. He's actually a Democrat. Uh, he has a 59% approval rating. So uh, Joe Manchin right up there among the, the most popular of the Democrats. And yet, well, you know where, what his standing is. So anyway, happy Tuesday. Thank you so much for joining me, Will. We'll do this again next week, okay? Thanks, Charlie. Thank you for listening today. But before we sign off, do you hate hearing ads on the podcast? Because I have a solution for you. Join Bulwark Plus, where members enjoy ad-free editions of this show and all the podcasts in our Bulwark network, like Beg to Differ with Mona Charon and The Focus Group with Sarah Longwell. There's also the member-only podcast, The Secret Show, and The Next Level with Tim Miller. You can give a Bulwark Plus membership a try for the next 30 days for free. Simply go to thebulwark.com slash charlie to claim your free trial today. This offer is exclusively for listeners of this podcast, The Bulwark Podcast. That is thebulwark.com slash charlie. The Bulwark Podcast is produced by Katie Cooper with audio production by Jonathan Siri. I'm Charlie Sykes. Thank you for listening to today's Bulwark Podcast, and we'll be back tomorrow to we'll do this all over again. Just getting started with Susie Schuster has stories of humble beginnings and humbling moments from inspiring people. Angela Kinsey. Listen, I, I was on set one day on The Office and I was like, we were talking about what's your good Switch. side. And I said, there's nothing really to that, right? That's like, oh, no, there is. And our camera operator, Matt Stone, that I had known for eight years, and I go, Matt, what's my side? He was like, this side. I was like, seriously? Oh. He goes, yeah. He goes, I always try to frame me that way. I was like, why didn't you tell me seven years ago? The new Just Getting Started with Susie Schuster. Listen wherever you get your podcasts. We're all juggling life, a career, and trying to build a little bit of wealth. The Brown Ambition Podcast with host Mandy and Tiffany the Budget Nista can help with special guest Chris Browning. You know, I'll give a shout out. I have two co-workers, Mandy, who love your podcast. They found out about me podcasting because of the last time I was on, on your podcast, That's the Brown Ambition. <laughs> we outed you. We yeah, outed you did. So you. spread it out a little bit further. Chances are if you work in an office with black women, Brown Ambition <laughs> is somewhere. Brown Ambition. Listen wherever you get your podcasts.